Welcome to uh, church this week. Uh, by the way, it's interesting. I can look at the clock on the wall. If you take, you can take a look at the clock on the wall. If the if uh, if the pastor goes long, then uh, you'll know that he thinks that he has another four hours to preach the sermon at all times. So you see that, right? So that's that's what he's going to be looking at during the sermon. So we're going to get the full in depth thing here, uh, which is which would be which could be actually very super. So. <laughs> His wife will want to go home, though, at some point. <laughs> All right. Uh, we are, uh, we're not projecting today. Uh, that's not a psychological term. That's a, a projector term. And so because we're not projecting, hallelujah, we're using the hymn books. I'm happy about this. So, uh, so yeah, praise the Lord. We got the hymn books going again. So, yeah, it's, that's, it's always good for me. It's like, oh, okay, that's all right. So I'm going to give you the hymn numbers as we go. Uh, the first two are right next to each other, 227 and 225. So we're going to open our worship with uh, singing praise him, praise him, and then praise him being Jesus, and then Jesus the very thought of thee and praise to him. So I invite you to stand, and we'll sing together. Blessed Redeemer, for our sins He suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the Crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus who bore our soul. can sing, no heart can 
Good morning, Trinity Baptist Church. Excellent welcome. I'm, I'm glad you haven't forgotten. We do have a special welcome to all those who may be visiting today. In the pew pockets in front of you, you will find a welcome card. If you haven't already done so, please fill it out and put it in the offering plate, which will be coming uh, along within the next few minutes. We are also welcoming back Schaefer Parker today and next week, who will be speaking. Uh, and uh, at the end of the month, for the last two Sundays, we've got well, Michael Lum, who's a student at the uh, seminary in Cochrane. He'll be speaking on the 23rd and the 30th. On the 7th of July, we've got Tim Goodwin. He is from Hope Mission here in Calgary. His, he has the same job that Kelly Rowe had uh, in community relations. So we get to see and meet with Tim the first Sunday in July. I was away last week, but I understood that there was a VBS meeting after last week, and that's great. And I understand there's supposed to be a VBS meeting online this Friday. But you know what? I don't know who's supposed to be included on that to get an email with the link. So if we could have a very brief VBS meeting after the service downstairs, please. Just all I want is the collective names to invite on the Zoom meeting. Last Friday night, just two days ago, we had a very productive work group. It seemed like, as if it was the Avengers, you know, Avengers Assemble. Well, we had about 11 fellows showed up. And I don't know if you noticed, did you notice this new fencing on the north side of the property? Well, it's only half done. Well, we worked till about, what, nine o'clock, was it? And we got here between five and six. And so guess what? We have the other half to finish. In the middle of all that was a wonderful uh, meal prepared for us. So let's do it again, shall we? On June, that's Friday, June 21st at 5 p.m. or close to it, we're going to reassemble and uh, finish the job, okay? And the meal is still included, I'm told, so that, that'll be wonderful. We've been talking about VBS a little bit, and that's going to happen at the end of August, August 23, 24, and 25. That's a Friday night, Saturday morning, and Sunday morning. Also going on this summer, though, is Summer Youth Celebration. It's a camp, otherwise known as SYC. SYC is being held again at Prairie Bible College in Three Hills on July 23 through to the 29th. Online registration is open, and it's open to students from grade 6 through to grade 12. This church, Trinity Baptist Church, if you want, if you attend here and you want to go to SYC, we're providing for your transportation and we will refund a portion of the fee to attend. So if, okay, you still got to be in grade six to grade 12. <laughs> but if you're in that age and that grade category, uh, you make sure to talk to Alejandro or Maria 
and we'll make sure that you understand what needs to go on to be a part of SYC this year. That's all the announcements I know of. Let's just have the uh, ushers come forward for the morning offering, and let's just dedicate our time together to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for, well, on a personal note of being back here with our family at Trinity. But I thank you for the opportunity we have of being here and meeting. Some of us were already meeting here a while ago as we were studying the scriptures talking about becoming a Christian and how to share our faith. And I thank you for that hour of instruction. And now as we had our time of fellowship in the foyer and moving into a time of worship with singing and with the word, Lord, I pray that you would richly bless this time that we have together. May your spirit be in charge. May we exhibit the unity that that spirit provides each one who has put their personal faith and trust in you. We come this morning to glorify your name, to praise you for all that you have done. Right now, Lord, we give back to you a portion of that which you've entrusted to us as stewards for the furtherance of your kingdom through this place. I pray that you would bless both gift and giver and give wisdom to those who are using those funds. May they be used in accordance with your will in ways that are pleasing to you. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand five, to sing 543, <clears throat> and then we'll be going to 569 after that. <clears throat> Since I have been redeemed, 543, and if you want, you can hold your finger in 569, although I'll give you enough time to make the flip. I will. 
glory in my Savior's name. I have a home prepared for me since I have been redeemed, where I shall dwell eternally since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, Number 569, make me a blessing. 569. It has been our custom of late to have a time when we spend in prayer with one another. And it has also been a custom that I forget to dismiss the children. <laughs> uh, one that I need to stop doing. And so if there are children today, you may be dismissed. Or if you're just feeling childish, that's probably a good hint as well. Let's come before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, I thank you for that and praise your name for the wonderful salvation you provided to us. You gave us hope when we had no hope. It was through your Son. Hallelujah. And Father, 
we come before you this morning, a people, your people, here to give thanks to you, to honor you, to give glory to you for all that you have done. We've come to study your word, to find out more about you, to find out how we ought to live in light of that knowledge. Father, there are many things we need to pray about and bring before you. Lord, we thank you for the transition team we have that is helping guide us through the, uh, the ministry assessment, which is now complete. And they are also embarking on the search for a new pastor. Lord, we pray for them. We pray for the man you have chosen to be our pastor. We don't know who. But I pray that you would prepare us for him and him for us. May we recognize him when it becomes apparent that we're presented with someone to consider. Father, I also pray for those who are experiencing medical challenges. Lord, I haven't heard anybody you know, special this week, but usually when the medical challenges come, they come for a while. We've got to wait for a seat of specialist or for an opportunity <laughs> in hospital. Lord, you say you comfort us, and you do. When we don't know what to do, we can always turn to you in prayer. Lord, I don't know what the outcome of every individual situation is going to be, but we can share our hearts with you. We can tell you we want our, those, those who we love but are not well enough to attend to be restored to health, to be restored perhaps to mobility, to be relieved of their pain, or to regain some health and endurance. Father, we pray for them and ask that you as the great physician would meet their needs in accordance with your will. Father, we also pray for those students among us who will soon be writing exams and tests at the end of the school year this month. We ask that you would allow them to have good recall of the things that they've studied. And Lord, I remember what it was like when I was a student in school, and I would even pray that if I hadn't studied, could you please give me a bye right now? Well, Lord, you know, if it's in your will to do so. But also, Lord, teach us to be diligent. <laughs> and I just ask that the marks are fair. Lord, there may also be other questions about what now for summer or after high school or what direction after takes us. And I pray that you would guide those decisions. May all the decisions we make be done in light of what would please you and be in accordance with your will. Heavenly Father, we have much to plan for VBS this year. It will be done differently on different nights and days and different material and a new team coming together to do it. But Lord, I am so thankful for the excitement of that team right here at Trinity to reach out to children, our own children, the children our children know, the children around the physical neighborhood of this edifice that we're in. Oh Lord, I pray that all would be done to expand your kingdom, to please you, 
to share the gospel in a way that kids will understand and respond. I ask that you would help us to resolve in the couple months that still, well, almost three months that yet are before us, that those details would come together. May we work in unified harmony to do what is pleasing to you. Heavenly Father, I also pray specifically for certain individuals I will give by name, their first names. I don't know all of the details of each one's need, but I know that you do. And I pray that you would draw each one to yourself. Help everyone to become so totally dependent on you and to seek your face on a daily, moment-by-moment moment basis and in all their decisions, please and glorify you. So with that said, Lord, I, I pray for Randy and Gless. I pray for July, for Zia, for Gary and Yoli, for Rebecca, for Leah, for Brett, for Chris, who can't come out, for Lou, for Alejandro and Maria, for Renata, for Christopher and Mia, for Fred, for Dawn. Lord, these are ones we love. And we are thankful that you gave them and added them to our local body. You are the shepherd of we, the sheep here at Trinity. And you are looking after us. I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for the work of Schaefer Parker, for the times of expounding the word that he has had with us already. And I pray that you would be the one who takes his words, but it's, I would hope, your word that penetrates our hearts, that it would be your spirit that takes what you have written in your word and applies it to our hearts and minds and lives. But do use Schaefer as a catalyst. We thank you for all these things. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
Okay. Uh, so you can see that the events in chapter 8, the, what we're just about to read, only uh, these things take place within just a, a few days, less than a week after the finishing, the completion of building the wall. All right, with that in mind, I'm going to ask you to stand, please, as we read the Word of God together. Nehemiah chapter 8. And if you're wondering why are we standing, it should become clear to you as I read. So Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. Don't spend much time trying to think what the water gate is. None of the commentators know either. So we'll just leave it at that. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. Now, I want you to pay attention for reasons that will become, I hope, obvious in the message itself. I want you to pay attention uh, who told whom what to do. That is to say, the people told the priest Ezra what to do. That is significant. That matters. That means something. I'll tell you about it later. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Now, I'm, I'm trying to highlight those things that that uh, I guess you only see it back here, yeah. If you see that goldenrod uh, color, these are the things that I think stand out in each of the passages that I'm reading. So here we go, verse 4. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that had been made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maasiah on his right hand, and Padiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left hand. And, Israel, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua... Bani, Sherebiah, or Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maasiah, Kalita, Azariah, Jazabad, Hanan, Peliah, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. May God bless the reading of his word, and you may be seated. All right, let's spend a few minutes unpacking the text that we've just read. The events recorded on that day indicate that something new was happening among God's people, and that's what I want us to think about today. The great danger in the Christian life is that if we do not pay careful attention to our own spiritual well-being, the spiritual well-being of our churches and our own personal selves, we will, we will tend to slip backwards. Uh, it had happened to Israel so often and so much. But now is a time of revival, and we'll say more about that in just a moment. But let me remind you of the warning in the New Testament. See, this isn't just an Old Testament issue. This is a New Testament issue as well. It's where, for example, the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore we must pay much closer attention what we have heard, or to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Sliding away. 
And the Lord himself, speaking to those Christians at the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, he says, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. There's a real danger that we'll slip away. But this is not what's happening in Isaiah or in Nehemiah 8. Here we find the people of God coming back to God's word, returning to the love for God that they had at first. And all I can say is, God help us to be like them. Now, just by way of reminder, I've already mentioned this a little bit, but let me expand on it just for a second. Here's, here are some of the things that had happened to Israel in the last two generations just before Nehemiah chapter 8. First of all, the people had returned to the holy city, to Jerusalem, after 70 years of Babylonian captivity. And in that period of time, the altar had been rededicated. I mean, since they got back, the altar had been rededicated. The temple had been rebuilt, although it was just a shadow of the former temple. Its glory was nothing compared to Solomon's glorious temple. And Jerusalem's city wall had just been completed. The, the people could dwell in safety once again. As well as all that, Israel's memorial feasts and festivals were in the process of being restored. You know what I'm talking about. The Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Weeks, the Day of Atonement, Passover, and the Feast of Booths. But here's the thing that we need to keep in mind. All these feasts looked backward in history to celebrate God's faithfulness to his people in bringing them out of bondage in Egypt, bringing them into the Promised Land, and so forth. But, and this is something the Israelites hardly understood at the time, those festivals, those feasts, those celebrations also serve to remind Israel that God keeps all his promises. Not just to bring them back from exile, as they had, some of them actually still remembered, but also to eventually send them the long-promised Messiah. Now, it's impossible to fully understand all that God is doing at any particular moment in history, in your personal history, the history of the church you attend, the history of the country in which you live, the world, and so forth. It's impossible to know what God is doing at, at any particular moment, this, but this side of Cal, Cal, Calvary, in other words, on the other side of our Lord's suffering, death, and resurrection, now that we have that in our rearview mirror, so to speak, we can know two things for sure. Number one, we, we can know that God keeps his promises. And number two, we know history's end goal. Now, in a way that even the Israelites could not know, we know God keeps his promises because he's already sent Jesus. Jesus has already lived among us, already suffered, already died, already risen again, already ascended back to heaven, already sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Jesus has done all these things, so we know that God keeps his promises. But secondly, we know history's end goal, and no, I'm not really talking about us going to heaven when we individually pass away, when we individually die. Here's history's end goal. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul writes, Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is where all of history is heading, the to the place where willingly or unwillingly, gladly or, or agonizingly, every knee, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But there's a third thing we can know. We may have no idea how this day, and when I say this day, I'm talking about June the 9th, 2024, as we count time. We may have no idea how this day connects to that day, the day when every knee shall bow. But we can be certain that this day does connect to that day. This we must understand. It is a sin to doubt that God is at work today in this place, in this city, through this church, and in and through your life. And that he's doing all of that work for the purpose of bringing that glorious day that we've just read about from Philippians 2. He's doing all of that work through this church, through your life, in this city, everything else that's going on, he's doing it for the purpose of bringing that day into being. 
Now, it may sound like I'm about to shift gears, but I want to quote from Dr. J. Edwin Orr, who is renowned uh, in, in Christian scholarly circles, at least, as being the scholar best acquainted with the entire subject of revival. He studied it like no one else ever did, and he's written about it like no one else ever has. He is the, the man to go to if you want to understand the concept of revival among God's people, and he has summed up everything he knows about revival in one simple statement. Revival is the Spirit of God working through the Word of God in the lives of the people of God. And I want you to notice then that this is not revival uh, where some famous crusade minister comes and fills a stadium and hundreds of people come forward and uh, confess Christ. That may be an aspect of revival, but it begins in the hearts of God's people. It always begins in the hearts of God's people. J. Edwin Orr is right. The revival is the Spirit of God working through the Word of God in the lives of the people of God, and that's exactly what we see in this passage in Nehemiah chapter 8. What we see, what we've read, is a description of real revival, heaven-sent revival. Now, this revival created something new that had never really been seen before, and I'm, I'm calling it a, a kind of a, a proto-synagogue Remember, when you, when you turn to Matthew, you find that Jesus is always in the synagogue. And when you read the four Gospels, you find that Jesus is always in the synagogues. When you read the missionary journeys of Paul, you'll find that every city he entered, the first thing he did was go to the synagogue with his message of the ris risen Lord. And you also can kind of gather from what you read in the New Testament that the synagogue was the, the people at worship. This was something different from the temple. The synagogue, the temple could only be one place in Jerusalem. One temple, no more than one in Jerusalem. Synagogues could be everywhere. Jerusalem itself could be filled with synagogues in every little community and village and city and town in the world of that day had a synagogue. But it's always the people at worship. The, the priests and the Levites, if they lived in some, some area, might participate in synagogue worship, but not as a priest or a Levite. Those roles were relegated to the temple alone. In the synagogue, they were just another person worshiping in that place. Now, the rise of the synagogue, as found in the New Testament, is something of a mystery. But it needn't be. I mean, because the word is never found in the Old Testament. And it's hard to understand. You know, we have, we have the Old Testament. All the worship is focused on the temple, as far as we can tell. And then 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew. And then, boom, here we find a synagogue everywhere. In fact, those who've studied it say that in the first century, there really was, literally was, a synagogue or multiple synagogues in pretty much every community in the known world. Right across the Roman world and right across the, the, uh, the eastern part of the world, right into India and so forth. They just, they, they, there were synagogues everywhere. Where did they come from? I submit to you that in today's text, you see the birth of the synagogue movement as well as the beginnings of what we would call the local church, because there's no doubt that the local churches that were formed after Christ sent the disciples out into the world to witness about his resurrection and his salvation and so forth, the local churches were formed pretty much on the model of the local synagogue. But if you look at what we read in, in uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, it's all there. Everything about the synagogue is there. Everything about the local church is there. First, you have the voluntary assembly of the people. And then you have the opening of the scroll, which is the Word of God, the Scripture. And uh, you also have a pulpit. They built a platform, especially for Ezra, to stand upon as he read and as he explained things to the people. You have a pulpit. You have the people standing to recognize the, uh, the revelation of God, to honor the, the, the Bible as the revelation of God. You have praise offered to God. In this case, by Ezra, as we sing hymns, we're offering praise to God, the same thing. Then you have the response of the people, amen, amen, they say, as Ezra praises God. Then you have the reading of the law. That would be the Torah or the scriptures. Uh, but you have the reading of the law. Then you have the explanation and the exhortation, which is what I'm trying to do just now, a sermon, a message. And you have all of that in what we've just read, followed by a departure for a fellowship meal, and that is the love feast that, uh, that would correspond to the New Testament love feast in the time when we have a potluck and we love to get together and so forth. Here's the thing we need to recognize. This was the moment 
when worship ceased to be the property of priests and kings and moved into the market square to involve all the people. I said earlier, none of the commentators seemed to really understand what the Watergate was other than maybe it was a place where old water, like dirty water, flowed out. Maybe it was a place where new water flowed in. Nobody seems to know. But what we do know is there was a big open square there where the people could meet. And so this was the place where the people met in the square, in public, to worship God, all the people. This was the moment when the people began to be, to be prepared for the role that God had given them from the beginning, all the way back to Mount Sinai. It had always been God's intention that they should be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, that's exactly what God says. But heretofore, worship had been something the priests did inside the temple, separate from the people. Remember Zechariah? This is in Luke chapter 1. You'll recall the story of the birth of John the Baptist. Uh, Zechariah was John the Baptist's father, and we read there in Luke 1 that he had gone into the temple to offer incense while, and now I'm reading straight from Luke chapter 1, while all the people, the whole multitude of the people, were praying outside. So you see, worship was something the priests did inside the temple while the people prayed outside. But things changed when Christ ascended and the Spirit came down at Pentecost to fill all the believers in Christ. We have no idea. We seldom reflect on the radical change that took place when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and began to fill the hearts and the minds and the lives of all the believers. Listen to what happened. Paul explains it to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple? You are God's temple. And that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy, and you, <laughs> you, us, we, you are that temple. <laughs> it's astounding when you stop to think about what we are in relationship to God as compared to the Old Testament. We're no longer outside the temple. The gathered people of God are the temple of God. We are now the holy place where God dwells by His Spirit. So we're not even just the outside part. We're the holy place, the center of the building where God dwells by His Spirit. Do you remember how Zechariah went into the temple? Listen to this now. What had he done? What had he gone in there to do? And I'm quoting from Luke 1. He had gone in to burn incense. Now the book of Revelation reveals that in the true temple, which is referenced as well in Hebrews, if you'll recall, chapter 9 and so forth, in the true temple, the one made without hands, the, the heavenly temple, it is our prayers. You need to go back and read this for yourself. It is our prayers that are caught in golden bowls so that they come up before God like sweet-smelling incense. You can read it for yourself, Revelation 5, 8, and chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. And where's all this leading? It's time for us to understand then that what God declared his people to be back at Mount Sinai is now the continuing reality of our lives. Listen to Peter as he addresses the New Testament church. And if you think he's only writing to the Jews, think again. If you study all of chapter 2 in 1 Peter, you're going to discover that he's writing to those who once were not a people but are now the people of God. Who in the world could that be except the Gentile believers? You, he says in 1 Peter 2, 5, you, believers in the Christian era, are yourselves like living stones being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then just four verses later, you are a chosen race. This is verse 9. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's who we are today. That's a description of every local church where people are worshiping God in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what God had always intended his people to be. And it all began, the seeds of it were planted in Nehemiah chapter 8. Let me say it again. This was truly a people's movement. We've already seen that the worship in Nehemiah 8 was 
people led, that is, they demanded that Ezra come and read the scriptures and explain them to them and so forth. It was people led, not priest led. But now I want you to notice something else. There was no king at the front. Throughout the history of Israel and Judah, the king had led the way in worship. It was all about David or Solomon or their descendants, and the people followed their lead. When Judah had a godly king, the people were godly, sort of. When Judah had an ungodly king, the people would follow him straight into sin and depravity. But in Nehemiah's day, there was no king, and there wasn't going to be another king until Jesus came. The Babylonian exile had taken care of that. The destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of Solomon's temple, there were no kings. Now, there's still, David's line still existed, but they were not kings. They were never, never going to be kings again. So, there was no king, and the people, listen to this now, were not following a king as they asked Nehemiah or asked Ezra to bring the scroll and read to them. They were acting on their own initiative. It was because of a hunger in their own hearts. They had well and truly, and perhaps for the first time ever, become a covenant community under God, not an earthly king. What we need to understand is that in the past, the king was seen as the covenant representative. The covenant the, covenant the king made with God stood for the people. And I'm not saying there weren't people who worshiped God and loved God and studied the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures and stuff. Of course there were. But I'm saying there was this sense that the king was the covenant representative before God, and it was up to him to maintain the standards of the covenant and obey the, the strictures and so forth that were put into the covenant. But now they had become a community, a covenant community under God, and not any earthly king. They were being prepared for the day when God's people would acknowledge King Jesus they would acknowledge him and him alone as their covenant representative, as he is to this day. He is our covenant representative. We live under the new covenant. And how, how is that different? Well, in the, old day, in the old days when the covenant was dependent upon the king to be an effective representative, remember what these kings did, every one of them. They sinned in some grotesque way. David commits adultery and murder. Solomon has whatever it was, a thousand wives or something, you know, and, and just on and on it goes. All the kings were grotesque in how they broke the law and how they failed their task as the covenant representative. But in the, under the new covenant, there can be no failure because it is sealed in the blood of the perfect son of God. He is our covenant representative. He is, he's our king, and as such, he represents the covenant before God, but he's also our God, and he's also the perfect sacrifice for our sins, and on and on I could go. They were being prepared. These folk in Nehemiah 8 were being prepared for the day when God's people would acknowledge King Jesus, and in the ways that matter most, they were anticipating the day when those who confess Jesus is Lord would never again bow to a mere man. Finally, I want you to notice what lay at the heart of worship in Nehemiah. Scripture exposition. One of the saddest things, in my view, in modern church history is that all too often we're told that we'd be better off if we did something else other than expound scripture. You know, make it purely testimony time. People just get up and tell what a wonderful thing it is to be saved. Or, you know, instead of having a sermon, let's have a, a play. Can't you illustrate some scriptural truth? Well, of course you can. But I want you to notice that the heart of worship in Nehemiah 8, this proto-synagogue, uh, this proto-church, lay scripture exposition all morning long. They expounded the word of God. And what did that mean? Well, it meant the following. Previously, the king had been responsible for knowing the word of God. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 17, you'll find out that it says there, every new king of Israel was under God's orders to write out for himself a copy of the law of God so that he would know it. I mean, by the time you've written it out by hand, you'll know it quite well. You'll, not only would he know it, then he would be able to lead the people in keeping it. But because it was the king's duty, everybody else said, fine, let the king do it. That's why he gets the big salary. That's why he gets the palace. He's got all those servants, so he's got extra time to write out the word of God. I'm busy. I've got fields to plow and plant and harvest, and I've got other things to do. I've got work to do. I'll let the king focus on knowing the word of God. But now, 
Do you hear what's happening? The people are hungry for the word of God. Now the people realize, as never before, that it was their personal and collective responsibility to keep the covenant so that they could obey their heavenly Lord. Suddenly it wasn't David offering a sacrifice to stop the wrath of God. We don't need to get into this, but you can read it for yourself in 1 Chronicles 21 if you want some other time. But David had sinned by, uh, well, I won't even go, go into the details. David had sinned against God. And as such, God had sent a plague that was killing the people. And then David met with an angel that God sent, and he was bargaining with the angel to try to stop the plague. And, and, and he says, you know, you've got to stop this plague. And he refers to his own people, the citizens of Israel, the nation. He says of them, these sheep, what have they done? In other words, he understood that the plague that was killing people was his fault, and, and he wants to take responsibility for it. So he says to the people, these sheep, what have they done? And believe me, in those days, the people were happy enough to say, that's right, we didn't do anything, it's him. But now, it was the people who wept before God in repentance for having broken his laws. You see what I'm talking about? They've, they've moved the king to one side. They don't have a king anymore. They're worshiping God directly. They're hearing from God's word directly. And because of that, they're taking it personally. And they're aware, they're aware like they've never been before. I'm the man. I'm the woman. I'm the teenager. Remember, it keeps saying that everybody who could understand was there. The teenagers were there. Even probably some of the older children were there. And, and all of them are saying, I'm the teenager, I'm the child, I'm the one who's broken God's laws. Every one of them, I've broken them, I'm guilty before God. And they began to weep because the word of God had broken their hearts. But here's the fantastic part. Now it is the people who are in a position to learn something new about the love of God and the grace of God. Because they finally understood the righteousness of God's wrath and his judgment toward them, words of grace and forgiveness were as welcome to them as cool water to a man dying of thirst. When they heard, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and they were told, don't be grieved because the joy of the Lord is your strength, can you imagine what came to them? They're aware. We're under the judgment of God. We were sent into exile to learn to not be idolaters. And now we've come back to Jerusalem and we've been guilty, if nothing else. But they were guilty of many things. And Nehemiah and Ezra, both books make it clear many of the things that people were guilty of. Every kind of sin that you and I are familiar with. Uh, because it's happening in our lives or in our midst all the time. We're familiar with those things. But they were also guilty of returning to idolatry. They were guilty of once again making an idol out of the city of Jerusalem, out of the recently rebuilt temple. They were guilty perhaps of, of trusting the wall for their safety more than God for their safety. There were all kinds of things. And so when they were told, don't be grieved, and they were told to celebrate, that's just what they did. They feasted and they sent food and drink to those who had none, and there was great rejoicing. Why? I don't want you to miss this. It's right at the end of today's text. Because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Has that been part of your life experience? That you suddenly understand the words that are found in God's word? And there's great rejoicing in your heart because you know that your sin, as black as it is and as awful as it is and as, as much as it is des deserving of God's judgment, has been judged in the person of, of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he's offered himself as the sacrificial lamb. The wrath that fell on him was wrath you deserved. The, the suffering that he under underwent is suffering you deserved. But because he did it in your place, then all we who are like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. God has laid on him the iniquity of us all, and therefore we can believe and be saved. They understood the words that were declared to them. I hope you're getting it. If the word of God cannot break your heart, then the word of God cannot bless your heart. And it ought to be your prayer and mine that God would give us grace so that the word of God would do both for us on a daily basis. Break our hearts and bless our hearts. Now, I want to complete. I, oh, wait, I got all the time in the world. It's not even 8 o'clock yet. So, oh, good. Um, anyway, just some application and I'll be done. And here we go. No matter how bad things are, 
God is always doing greater things than you and I can imagine. He removed Israel's earthly kings and their kingdom. And from the perspective of the Israelites, that was the most horrible thing that could happen. But he replaced them with King Jesus and a worldwide heavenly kingdom. <laughs> I'm telling you, as scary as things are today, actually you will, you'll be grateful as long as this sermon is. I cut out like a page and a half because I spent some time describing how awful our world is today. And I even said things like it's very probable that unless we have a World War II veteran here, uh, maybe a Vietnam vet, but it's very probable that none of us have lived through any worse time than we have over the last four or five years in terms of, well, I'm, I'm not going to re-preach the part I cut out, okay? You know what I'm talking about. So I'm telling you then that as awful as things are today, God is preparing the ground for something more amazing than human minds can conceive. Secondly, in the past, God had revealed himself to Israel by a pillar of fire and smoke or by the fires of Mount Sinai and by the many miracles that brought the people to the promised land. But in today's text, the people learned that God could reveal himself in his word. In the past, the people of God had only returned to God when he punished them with invading armies. But now his word was sufficient to convict and to wound, but also to heal and to fill with joy. God, help us to live in such a way that God's word can get inside us. If it's not getting inside you, you need to be crying out to God that his word will get inside you, both to, both to wound and convict, but also to heal and to fill you with his joy. Thirdly, the promise made to the people that day that the joy of the Lord is your strength is the foundation for all thanksgiving and celebration. But we need to ask ourselves, what is the joy of the Lord? Quickly, joy over the defeat of his enemies. God is happy when he sees his enemies defeated. Look at Psalm 2.4 as just one example. Secondly, joy over rescue. That is, over the rescue, the redemption, and the full restoration of a relationship between God and his people. All that was lost in the garden is now restored by the Spirit. God has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. And God is happy about that. That's part of the joy of the Lord. Joy over seeing his people living out the victory that is ours in Christ, conquering sin and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and building the kingdom in the teeth of all opposition. God has given us everything necessary for life and godliness, Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 1. And the fact is, when, when we take advantage of that and when we begin to live out a life that, that is built upon the transformation of life that we have in Christ, God rejoices over that. And then joy that flows from his constant, that is God's constant knowledge, that the plan he laid down before the foundation of the world is working out perfectly so that in the end, Everything is worthy of eternal praise. This was the joy of the Lord that became the strength of the people of God. By the Spirit, we enter into his life and joy. Listen to Jesus' words in his great prayer of John 17. He says as he's praying before the disciples, praying to his Father the night of his arrest and crucifixion, he says, but now I am coming to you, Father, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. That is to say, by the Holy Spirit, we enter into his joy, and, he can, and his joy can be fulfilled in us. His joy, God's joy, filling our hearts. That is by the Spirit, uh, that by the Spirit, one of the special blessings of being a part of God's forever family is that his joy can flood our own souls. We don't fully understand what God is doing right now. I'm talking about June 9 in 2024. We, we don't fully understand what God's doing right now, but we can rest assured that this period of life is purposeful, that God is lifting our eyes from the things of earth in order to give us greater revelations of himself. You know, it's all transition until every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. So rejoice. The joy of the Lord really is your strength. God, help us to know it, to feel it, to experience it, as you would have us do and as you teach us in your word. May your word break our hearts, convict us of our sin, but may it also bless us with the knowledge of Christ's sacrifice and your forgiveness 
and your grace toward each one of us as we believe. In Jesus' name, amen. What are we going to sing, brother? Number 317 in your hymn books. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord, and he will surely give you rest by trusting in his word. 569, I invite you to stand. have a seat. We didn't get the chance to do this two weeks ago when we normally would have, but the timing's right today. You're thinking, what? <laughs> We're welcoming Dodi Aquino as a member of our church. Dodi, come on up. 